Okay, in this video we're going to continue studying cosets by looking at something called Lagrange's theorem. So let's just recall that a coset of a group is given by the following. So we have a subgroup of a group G and the left coset of H in G with representative little g is given by our notation is G capital H and that's equal to all elements of the form G little h as h ranges over all elements from this subgroup. And the theorem that we want to prove is the following. So let's let G be a finite group and h is a subgroup of this group. Then G the number of elements in G is equal to the number of elements in H. That's what we mean by those absolute value signs around the groups. Times something called the index of H and G, which we denote by these brackets in this colon GH. And that's equal to the number of elements in H times the number of cosets of H in G. So there'll be a certain number of cosets that you can form out of H, and that's what we call the index. So this number right here is the same thing as this number right here. And then a quick corollary to that is that the size of a subgroup of a group must divide the size of the group. Okay, but before we can do that, we need the following lemma, and that is distinct cosets of H and G partition G. Okay, so the first thing that we want to show is that, that cosets do not overlap. So let's suppose we have an element x which is in the intersection of two cosets. Great. And so what this tells us is that x can be written as g1 times h and x can be written as g2 times h prime and this is for some h h prime which are different in capital H which are probably different in capital H. Okay, great. But now we can reorder this a little bit as follows. That tells us that G1H equals G2H prime. Great. But now notice that means that G1 equals G2 times H prime times H inverse, which is an element of the coset G2H. So in other words, we have G1 is an element of the coset G2. But now, notice that that tells us that G1, and then maybe let's do H double prime, is equal to G2, H prime, H inverse, H double prime. But now notice, this is just an element from H. Great. And then we can range H double prime over all elements from H, and this is in G2H. But it follows that we've taken something like this, which is representing every element from the coset G1H, and we've written it as something that's in G2H. So what this tells us is that G1H is a subset of G2H. Great. But then also, we could pick up back at this equation right here and rewrite this in the following way. We can write G2 equals G1H H prime inverse, which notice that's an element of G1H. And then we can do a very, very similar calculation to get that G2H, that coset, is a subset of G1H. But now we see that G1H is a subset of G2H and vice versa, G2H is a, co is a subset of G1H. So what that tells us is that G1H and G2H are exactly the same. So in other words, if we have two cosets that overlap at all, they have to be equal. So that's the first thing that we need to sh show to show that cosets partition the group G, and I really should be saying left cosets here. The next thing that we need to show is that, in fact, if we take the union of all cosets, we get the whole group. And let's do that after erasing the board. Okay, so far we've proven that different cosets are disjoint. In other words, if we have two cosets, G1H and G2H, they're either the same or they intersect to the empty set. 
And we did that by saying, well, what if they don't intersect to the empty set? Then we found this element X that's in both of them and they ended up being the same. So that's one step along showing that these cosets partition the group. The next thing is to show that we can write the group as a union of all the cosets. So now let's suppose that G is in G. And what we want to do is find a coset that G is inside, but that's actually quite easy um, because notice we can write G equals G times the identity, but that's going to be inside the coset um, with representative the G that we started with, and that's because H is a subgroup which subgroups contain the identity so that makes it uh, done. So in other words, we've proven that the cosets of H and G partition G. Okay, so I'll clean up the board and then we've got another limit approved. Okay, so the next lemma we want to prove is that if we have a group G and a subgroup H, so I've left that off here for brevity, then the size of the subgroup is the same thing as the size of any of its cosets. So let's include that in there for all G and G. So that means all cosets have the same size. And we can do that uh, by just constructing a bijection. So let's consider the following map. So we're going to have phi, it goes from h to gh, given by phi of little h, where that's an element from big H equals g times little h. So obviously here we have the input is in the subgroup and the output is in the coset. Okay, great. So now let's show that this is injective and surjective. So let's suppose that phi of h equals phi of h prime. So what that tells us is that gh equals gh prime. But then we have left cancellation in groups, which is just multiplying both sides of the equation by g inverse on the left. And that's going to give us h equals h prime. And that's what we need to show that this is injective. Now uh, for surjectivity, Let's take an arbitrary element from this coset GH, but now by definition, that means we can write X equals G times little h for some little h in big H. That's just the structure of the coset. But now notice that if you apply phi to that H, we're going to get g times little h, which is the same thing as this x we started with. So we have surjectivity as well. So, but then remember, if you've got a function that's bijective between two sets, those sets have the same cardinality, which is what we wanted to show. All right, I'll clean up the board and then we're ready to prove Lagrange's theorem. In other words, we're ready to prove that the size of a group equals the size of a subgroup times the number of cosets it has. In other words, or, and it follows that the size of a subgroup always divides the size of a group. Okay, so now we're ready for the proof of this theorem, which is not so bad with all the setup that we have. So the first thing that we want to do is suppose that the number of elements in G equals N, just so that we have something to work with, and G1 of H, sorry, G1H all the way up to GKH is a complete list of left cosets of H and G. Okay, great. So before we showed that the cosets partition the group, well, that means we can get a complete list. And again, we know all this stuff is finite because the size of the group is finite, so there must be a finite number of cosets. Okay, great. Now, uh, the next thing that we can do is use the previous lemma, not the last one, but the one before that, to show that um, the group itself is equal to G1H union, G2H union, 
uh, up to GKH. And now I can put maybe little dots over this to mean disjoint union if you want, or we can add this over here. So GIH intersect GJH equals the empty set if I is not equal to J. So in other words, the, that's a disjoint union. Now from here what we can do is say that the size of the group is now going to be equal to the sum I equals 1 to K of the size of each of these cosets. Good, but we know that the size of each of these cosets is the same, so that gives us the sum I equals 1 to K of the size of the subgroup from the previous lemma. Great, but if we notice that if this is a complete list of cosets, that's the same thing as saying that K equals the index of H in G. Great. But now notice here we can write this as K times the size of H, which is the same thing as the size of H times this index. Now if we look at the extreme left and right hand side of the equation, we have achieved what we wanted to. Now the next thing to notice is that this immediately implies that um, the order of H divides the order of G just by the definition of uh, divisibility in elementary number theory. Okay, great. So now uh, I want to clean up the board and look at a couple of examples. Okay, so now we're ready to look at a couple of quick corollaries of Lagrange's theorem. So now let's suppose that G is a finite group. But that's all. It could be abelian, it could be non-abelian, anything. Great. Now the first one I want to notice is that for all elements G and G, the order of the element must divide the order of the group. Great. And so why is this true? And that's because the cyclic subgroup generated by that element is a subgroup of the entire group and the order of that cyclic subgroup is the same thing as the order of the element that is generating it. But then we know the order of any subgroup must divide the order of the group, so that gives us the order of this cyclic subgroup has to divide the order of the group. In other words, the order of the element has to divide the order of the group. Okay, good. So, now let's look at another one. If the order of G is equal to P, which is a prime, then the only subgroups are the whole group and the uh, trivial subgroup, so, which is just the identity. And now we know that there are no in-between subgroups because any in-between subgroup would have order between 1 and P and would have to divide P, but obviously there are no numbers that divide this prime. Great. And now notice it also follows that um, this G in this last example is cyclic. And how we can do that is choose some element G in G which is not equal to the identity and notice that means that the subgroup which is just the identity is not equal to this cyclic subgroup generated by G but since there are no subgroups between the trivial subgroup and the whole group then this actually has to be the whole group so any group of order a prime must be cyclic. Okay, great. So I think this is a good place to end this video.